Welcome to Made in NZ. In June 1987, the abduction, rape and murder of six-year-old Teresa Cormack shook the country. For the police hunting her killer, it was the beginning of an inquiry that would take them more than 14 years to complete. Inside Operation Cormack tells the story of how one man's crusade led to the capture and imprisonment of one of New Zealand's most horrendous criminals. One wet Friday in June 1987, a family in Napier lost their daughter. The abduction, rape and murder of Teresa Cormack shook the country. For police hunting her killer, it was the beginning of an inquiry that would take them more than 14 years to complete. Finally, the story can be told of how one man's promise to a murdered six-year-old girl led to the capture and imprisonment of one of New Zealand's most horrendous criminals. Tonight, we go inside Operation Cormack. Tonight, hundreds of volunteers search for missing Napier schoolgirl. Good evening. Network News for Sunday, the 21st of June. Hundreds of volunteers today join police in searching for missing Napier schoolgirl, six-year-old Teresa Cormack. Teresa went missing on Friday, one day after her birthday, and police fear that she's been abducted. As a police officer stationed in the neighbouring district of Hastings, Detective Sergeant Brian Shab was called in to join the search for the little schoolgirl. He could not have guessed that these were to be his first days on an operation that would consume the majority of his police career. In those days, for a six-year-old girl to be snatched off the street and, and taken away, you know, it was almost was unheard of, really. In the faces of Kelly Piggott and Ross Cormack, New Zealanders saw the tragedy of parents desperately hoping for a young daughter's safe return. There's obviously talk that someone's taken her. If that's happened, what would you say to that person? Just let her come home. We need her home. And what if she's out there, watch, perhaps watching this? Just we love her. We love her so much. Teresa had been missing for three days, and although there had been no reported sightings of her, police still believed she would be found alive. When she hadn't been found by Sunday, it got a lot more intensive even then, although we, you know, we were still looking just for a lost little girl because there was nothing to suggest anything untoward that had happened to her. After nearly a week of fruitless searching, their optimism evaporated. You know, we were starting to think that we were probably looking for a dead body as opposed to a lost little girl, and even sort of the middle of that week, um, of course, that wasn't confirmed, really, until we uh, found the body on the Saturday. A big team of police was on the beach at Furunaki, north of Napier, by 9 this morning, after the body was found by a woman out walking her dog about 8.30. It was lying face down in the shingle near a tree at the top of the beach, where it's thought to have been dumped from the road. Brian Shab was assigned as officer in charge of Teresa's body at the beach. Witnessing for himself the awful tragedy of her death, inspired him to make a promise to the little girl. You know, just looking at her and realising where we were and what had happened, um, you know, I think probably everyone was on the beach that day, you could just feel a resolve that, you know, we'd get this guy one day. I mean, no one deserved to die like that. Certainly not a, a lovely little six-year-old girl. And, um, you know, even though you might be a hardened old policeman, you know, you, there's, there's certain things that still can affect you and you know I um, you know, promised myself for Teresa's sake that you know we'd just keep going until we found this guy and uh, you know I never really felt that we, that we never would. Detective Sergeant Shab's confidence in finding the murderer was in part based on the enormous flood of information police received from the public. Sightings of a small girl in a red raincoat on the streets of Napier confirmed that Teresa had walked the half kilometre from her house to school between 8.30 and 9 that Friday morning. Police believed she had most likely been abducted soon after the school bell rang at 9. Nominations of suspects came pouring in from the public, 
and police began looking at each one in turn to see if they could establish an alibi for the period before 10 o'clock on the morning of Teresa's disappearance. As we went through several of them for various reasons, you know, looked quite promising in the early stages in that they couldn't account for where they were or we had uh, quite reliable information that somehow they were involved. Ross, Kelly, and baby Sarah Jane, we are gathered here today as a grieving family because of the actions of a person or persons at this time unknown. As the country joined with Teresa's parents in mourning the loss of an innocent young life, police immersed themselves in finding the person responsible for such an appalling act. We were just going around um, anyone that was nominated as a suspect, chasing them up and um, interviewing them, uh, attempting to alibi them if we could, and either um, eliminating them or putting them in. I think it's actually been eliminated, um, yeah. Many of the suspects police investigated were known sex offenders. You know, various suspects started to look good, and of course the team would focus more on that aspect of the inquiry. Um, but as it panned out, each one of those suspects was eliminated as far as they could be at the time, and uh, you moved on to the next one. The problem police faced in pinpointing the offender was a lack of physical evidence. Teresa's body had lain exposed on the beach for over a week. During that time, seas whipped up by a storm had washed over her and stripped away possible forensic clues. But pathologists who examined her did manage to recover, as well as discovering a partially digested lolly in her stomach. Vaginal swabs were found to contain traces of semen. Three pubic hairs were also found in Teresa's mouth and underwear. Solving the murder was going to depend on identifying whose semen and pubic hairs they were. Well, in 87, there were the earliest um, DNA profiling analyses carrying on, but you needed a large sample size to be able to get a result. The semen and pubic hairs recovered from Teresa's body were far smaller crime scene samples than ESR could successfully process in 87. To establish whether or not the semen sample could reveal the genetic fingerprint of the offender, it would need to travel to England for testing. This is a destructive process. All the DNA that was recovered was used during that analysis. It was put into, onto a gel and run, and it was insufficient to get a result. The cotton wool swabs containing the murderer's semen had been destroyed without yielding his identity. The police's most vital clue was now gone. But before the swabs were sent overseas, an important event had occurred. Fearing that the English tests would completely destroy the swabs, an ESR scientist sliced off a tiny portion of one swab and sealed it between two glass microscope slides. That minute sample of semen preserved between the slides was now the only real way of identifying the killer. But it would take science another 14 years to develop a test for such a minute sample. Teresa Cormack had been dead for nine months. Police had been unable to find her killer, but somehow her parents never lost hope that one day they would. My faith in the police was never actually shaken at all. I didn't see any cause to. It was a frustrating situation for us and for them. And no, nah, never shaken. It was one of those cases, and unfortunately that happens every now and then, that we just can't do any more. And, you know, Ross and Kelly accepted that. They knew the effort that had been put into it. But they also believed as you know, we believe that one day this will keep going and one day we'll, we'll catch this guy. Operation Cormac had produced a list of 845 suspects, with 20 names singled out as top priority. Many had alibis covering the time frame that police believed the abduction had occurred in. What's more, DNA technology could not yet effectively prove whose pubic hair and semen had been found on Teresa's body. With no other lines of inquiry leading anywhere, the investigation was scaled down. Well, that's the first time I thought about not catching the guy. I always assumed that it was going to happen. And then when they said it was going to scale down, I thought, oh, well, maybe it's not going to happen. A microscope slide was now the only hope Kelly and Ross had of finding their daughter's killer. But we had to wait. So we waited. 
And it was the only chance Brian Shab had of ever delivering on his promise to Teresa. What? What do you mean a profile? He'd have to wait 14 years for that. Bullshit. 